coming up on Foundation for Life with Dr. Waylon Bailey. When we know that Jesus said, I'm going to send you out as sheep among wolves, but I'll be with you. When Jesus sent his disciples, as you go, make disciples of all nations, and I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. on his second missionary journey, traveled from Philippi down to Corinth in southern Greece. And there he preached the gospel in the most unlikely place and in the most unlikely time, the word of God went out and people were saved. When Paul went to Corinth, as far as we know, there was not one Christian And the word of God goes out, and the word of God never returns void. And people were saved. In a few minutes, we'll talk about how unlikely that was. If you were ever going to say, uh, where are we going to plant a church? Nobody would have ever picked Corinth. People plant a church, and they're always looking for fertile soil, and that makes good sense. And they're looking for maybe men and women of peace who are there ready to hear the Word of God. None of that was in Corinth, and yet Paul went there, and the Word of God went out. And I want to use this passage of Scripture because I want to encourage you to renew your optimism about life, about God, about the church, about what God is doing in the world. God knows who we are, and God knows what is happening around us. I want you to hear that we need to renew our hope and our optimism because the only optimism we have is by trusting God and knowing who he is and letting him speak to our hearts. So please, please hear the word of the, God, of the Lord and let it be that living word that speaks to you. Acts chapter 18. After this, Paul had been to Philippi. He was beaten and thrown in jail. He'd been Thessalonica. They had a riot and he was beaten. He went to Berea and the Jews... The unbelievers from Thessalonica came to Berea and they hustled him out of Berea and Paul went by himself to Athens and then he went to Corinth. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius, the Roman emperor, had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them. And because he was a tent maker as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Every Sabbath, he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks of what? Jesus is the Messiah. Not only is he the Messiah, he's the risen Lord. When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. But when they opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, you bl- your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent of it. From now on, in Corinth, I will go to the Gentiles. So Paul left the synagogue and went, notice how far he went, he went next door, to the house of Titus Justus, a worshiper of God. Listen to this. You want to be encouraged? He goes to the synagogue. 
But they won't listen in the synagogue. They abuse him. Maybe physically, but certainly verbally. Crispus, the synagogue leader, and his entire household believed in the Lord. And if you keep reading on in Acts, you find that it was Paul and Timothy who wrote, Paul and Sosthenes who wrote a letter to Corinth. Who is Sosthenes? He was the next guy they voted in to be the leader of the synagogue. Does God do great things? So Crispus and his entire household believed, and many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed and were baptized. One night, the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision, don't be afraid. Keep on speaking. Don't be silent, for I am with you. And no one is going to attack and harm you because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half teaching them the word of God. Now I know you have heard it, and I've heard it too. 2020 is the worst year. I can't wait for 2020 to get over. I can't wait for 2021 to get here and we start everything over. And on some level, we all get that. And on some level, we probably all thought that or said that. But I sim can simply cannot see that coming from the heart of a person who is filled by the Spirit of God and who lives by the Word of God. Because while, yes, this is a pretty tough year, while this is a difficult time, while this is something like none of us have ever seen, it is probably not the worst year that there's ever been. Paul could have said, I've never had a year like A.D. 49, because A.D. 49 is when he went to Corinth. We know that because the, the Word of God and the history of the Romans coincide they come directly together in AD 49 because Paul was in Corinth and Aquila and Priscilla were there and why were they there they were there because Claudius the Roman emperor we know from Roman history Claudius expelled all the Jews in AD 49 so we put it all together right here in AD 49 Paul went to Philippi and they beat him unmercifully we know from the history of the times that, most, that maybe the majority of the times when the Romans administered a beating, the person died for it, even immediate, either immediately or in a short period from infection afterwards. Think about the beating of Jesus. Think about his back, a bloody pulp. Think about what he went through at the hands of the Romans. When the Romans beat somebody, they were, it was an unmerciful way of doing it. So Paul was beaten in Philippi. Then they cast him in jail. You know the story. Acts chapter 16, they're in Philippi. Paul and Silas both beaten to a pulp. At midnight, start singing, testifying about God. Make it clear to everybody they're there, not because they've done wrong, but because they've preached the word of the Lord. Other prisoners were listening to them. Two reasons. Number one, because wouldn't you listen to somebody who has been beaten unmercifully and yet can sing and live a life of joy? And the other reason they listen to them is they're all in a small little prison and they didn't have much choice but to hear the word of God. And Paul and Silas gave them word of God. And there was an earthquake and the prison was broken open. And the Roman, the Roman jailer who would have died would have been executed if one prisoner would have escaped, came running in and was about to take his own life. And Paul urgently cried out, don't harm yourself. We're all here. Nobody's gone. And the Roman jailer asked those questions. What must I do to be probably meant delivered? What must I do to be saved? And Paul and Silas 
took the, the question and told him what he really must do to be saved. And the Philippian jailer believed. And the jailer, who had cared nothing for Paul and Silas before, not even, not even feeding them, not even cleansing their wounds, took them home with him, cleansed their wounds, gave them food to eat, and the jailer believed, and his whole household believed. Paul gets out of prison. He gets out of prison because the magistrates learn, who have put him in prison and had him beaten, the magistrates learn that he was a Roman citizen, and you were not to beat a Roman citizen. It was punishable by death. So the magistrates, when they learn this, they send the Roman jailer back, tell Paul and Silas, tell Paul, we apologize for beating you and throwing you in jail, and you are free to go. Now, there's one, there are a lot of things I appreciate about this man we call Paul, but here's one of them, and it may tell you more about me than it does about him. So they say, tell Paul he can go. Paul said, look. You beat me in public. You put me in prison in public. You accused me in public. You said in public, I'm a lawbreaker. If you want me to leave your prison, you come in public and let me go. And they did. And Paul went to Thessalonica. And when he went to Thessalonica, he started a riot. There's, there are a lot of things that are said about Paul. One of them, the famous quotation is this, that everywhere Paul went, he either started a riot or he started a revival. And in most places, he started riots and revivals. But of course, he didn't start the riot. All he did was tell the good news of Jesus that whom God had sent into the world and God raised from the dead. He went to Thessalonica and a riot started and they beat him again. So Paul has been beaten to the point of death two times in a very short period of time. And then he goes to Berea and the, the, the gospel, the book of Acts tells us that the Berean Jews were much more noble than the Thessalonican Jews because they listened the word of God and they opened the word of God and they examined what Paul had to say. But the Jews from Thessalonica came to Berea and they started another riot and they hustled Paul out of town. When Paul went to Corinth, he was struggling. He was hurting. You know what it's like when you are physically beaten and by that, maybe you have a, a bad illness. When we are physically hurting, we also are very susceptible to depression and discouragement. And many biblical scholars believe that's exactly the way Paul was thinking. Because the Lord Jesus appeared to him and he said, don't be afraid and don't be silent. I am with you, and no one is going to attack you or harm you in Corinth. Now, if you believe, as I do, that God doesn't waste any words and that every word of God comes directly from his mouth, that God breathes every word, then these words are not wasted. Why did the Lord Jesus appear to Paul? It must be because he was struggling with being silent, because he was afraid. One biblical scholar said that the apostle Paul was one beating away from being able to ever function again. Either it would kill him or it would break him. But notice what the Lord Jesus did. In that time, the Lord Jesus appeared to him and gave him exactly what he needed. And I really believe that if your spirit is open to God today and you are willing to hear what he has to say, that God will give you what you need to be optimistic and hopeful and to keep ongoing in this difficult time so what do we hear from the word of God 
What, did, what happened to Paul? What did Paul do to become optimistic, to renew his optimism? Four things. Number one is this. He prayed fervently. And the thing that you and I need to do is to pray fervently. James the Apostle said that the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous person, it does great good. Praying fervently. Jesus prayed fervently. We all know about the Garden of Gethsemane so that his prayer was so fervent. Not my will but thine be done. That there was his perspiration were as it were great drops of blood flowing from his body. We know what Jesus did. I take so much encouragement of what Luke said about Jesus. When it came time to appoint the 12 disciples, what did Jesus do? Well, here's what Jesus did. He left one afternoon. He went up into the hills around the, around the Sea of Galilee. He stayed all night. The next morning, he came down from the hills and he appointed the 12. And while Luke doesn't give us everything that he did, It's hard to imagine, hard to understand anything other than the fact that all night long he had prayed fervently for the direction of the heavenly father of who would be those disciples. And so he appointed the 12. God wants us to pray fervently. God wants us to cry out to him. God wants us to, to let him in on our lives. Years ago, I made a a decision that I was going to take everything to God in prayer. But then I learned how hard that is. Because I keep wanting to take it back and let it be my choice, my decision, my idea. But you don't live in hope based on my idea. You live in hope and confidence when we seek God and we pray fervently and when God leads us and we know that God is leading us. Then we live in confidence. Then we renew our optimism. A second thing that that Paul did and a second thing that we can do is to live and rest in the promises of God. Listen, look at this vision. Look at this Look at what the Lord Jesus said to Paul. Don't be afraid. Speak out. Don't be silent. I am with you. No one, you've been harmed, Paul. It was hard in Philippi. It was hard in Thessalonica. It is hard in Berea. But nobody is going to harm or attack you. And Luke gives us the the answer to that. So you know what happened? God gave him a promise. And God always keeps his promises. And we need to live in those promises. I know about what half of you are saying right now. I wish God would give me a promise. Paul didn't have the New Testament. But you do. And it is filled with promises of who God is. And as much as anything in the world, you need to be in the word of God and memorizing the promises and praying them to God and remembering what his promises are. We can have great optimism when we live in the promises of God, when we know that Jesus said, I'm going to send you out as sheep among wolves but I'll be with you. When Jesus sent his disciples, as you go, make disciples of all nations, and I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. Think about the promise that you and I have right now. Those of us who have followed after Christ, who have put our trust in him and surrendered our lives to him, in whom God's Holy Spirit lives, you and I have the promise that when we die or when the Lord comes again, we're going to be in the immediate presence of the Lord. 
Going to that place of being in the conscious presence of the Lord with joy and peace and hope and forgiveness and no more sin and no more temptation and no more darkness and no more evil. That's the promise we have to live in. That as death comes, that we're going to be in the presence of God. How can you be more optimistic than that? I see a lot of death. And I have a lot of funerals. Uh, my dad always said, you, you preach your own funeral and you do it a long time before you die. It's funny how you remember some things that were said a long time ago. And that's the way it works for a believer. When a woman of God, a man of God dies and they've been faithful to the Lord, not perfect, just faithful to the Lord, godly people, those sermons, those funeral sermons, they come easy, easy, easy. But I've seen people who didn't have any hope and their grieving is the most intense kind. We can be optimistic as we know God and live for God. And there should be this eternal hope that just flows through our veins because of what God has done for us in Christ. We live and rest in the promises of God. A third thing that you can do to renew your optimism is to stay connected with godly people. Now think about Paul. If we're correct that there was a, a, a great deal of discouragement and of physical pain and, and maybe wondering what was going to happen in the future. If we're correct that that was what was happening, what was going on in Paul's life? Well, he was all alone. Not one Christian there until Aquila and Priscilla show up. And then he begins to work with them. And you can almost imagine the encouragement that came from them because they had been in Rome. They became Christians independent of Paul. They became Christians probably because of the day of Pentecost. 3,000 people saved and then all of them going back home. There was a vibrant church in Rome that had nothing to do with Paul. And so they are there, and they can tell about how God has been at work and how people are being saved and how lives are being changed. And then what else happened? Then Silas and Timothy, they came from Berea because they stayed behind in Berea. They got Paul out of town to protect him. They stayed behind. Then they came, and now you've got five people in Corinth. They are Man, think about this to have on your church staff. Paul, Timothy, Silas, Aquila, Priscilla. Five missionaries proclaiming the good news of God. Then later on, Crispus, the leader of Jews in Corinth, gets saved and his whole household. And then amazingly, Sosthenes replaces him. And then Sosthenes helps Paul write the letter to Corinth. It is amazing what God does. And we need to see what God does. And can you see the importance of being connected to people? God establishes churches. God created the church. God told us not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. God is the one who tells us that we are the body of Christ. So hard as it is to imagine, you just kind of look around you, and all of us are the body of Christ. We are different members of the one body of Christ. We get optimism. We get hope. We get encouragement. We get the strength to keep on and keep on keeping on when we stay connected with godly people. There's a fourth way you renew your optimism. You renew your optimism by trusting God completely. What if Paul, what if Paul has gotten this promise from the Lord, but God, I'm afraid you're not going to keep it. God, I'm, a, I'm afraid you're not going to do it. That's, that can't be 
in the life of a Christian. One of the things we have to do is to, is to trust God. So if you have to say it this way, say it this way. God, I know your word is true. I know I can depend on it, but God, I'm having a hard time right now depending on it. So I need you to help me depend on it. And I need you to help me believe. And I need you to help me have faith. Corinth was that place, as I mentioned earlier, it is the last place on the face of the earth you would ever think about planning a church. You just wouldn't do it. Most biblical scholars say it is the most unlikely place in all of the Roman Empire for a church to develop and to grow and to become strong. Now, in the Roman Empire, when every kind of perversion was practiced in the first century A.D., in, where every kind of perversion was practiced, and we have plenty of examples of that in Roman history, to say that Corinth was the worst place of all was making an awful statement. There were statues of Aphrodite everywhere. There were statues of Apollo everywhere, a male god. In the vilest of poses and in the vilest of pictures. And the perversion, the homosexuality was rampant in Corinth. And yet in the middle of that darkness, God established the church. If God can plant a church in Corinth, what can he do in Covington? If God can grow a church and make it strong and the word of God can go out in the lives of prostitutes, what can he do in your life? When we get down and think that God can't do anything, Look at Corinth and remember that God is at work. And right now, all around the world, God is at work and people are being saved and lives are being changed. And God is planting churches. God is putting the Christian flag all over the world. And God is working out his purpose. And we should not be depressed. But we should be encouraged and we should be optimistic and we should be hopeful and we should live out the gospel every day, giving our best for the glory of God. This is what he wants us to do. Live on the North Shore or planning to visit? Join us here at First Baptist Church Covington for one of our three weekend services. Come be encouraged by Dr. Bailey every Saturday evening at 6 or Sunday mornings at 9.30 or 11 a.m. For more information and directions to our church, visit fbccov.org. First Baptist Church Covington. Experience life-changing relationships. Be sure to tune in again next week for Foundation for Life.